Okay, we're going to get started. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Wilson Center. I am Sarah Barnes, and I lead the Maternal Health Initiative here at the Center. For those of you who are not familiar with the Center, the Wilson Center is a living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, who remains the only president to have earned his PhD. <laughs> The Maternal Health Initiative focuses on ending preventable maternal mortality in navigating gender-based health issues globally through convenings like today, through research, and through actionable ideas. This event, a growing threat, non-communicable diseases on maternal health, is at the very heart of our mission. Some 18 million women of reproductive age die each year from NCDs and our Code Blue series was designed to look at seven NCDs most threatening to women's maternal health. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, mental health, multiple sclerosis, cancer, and thyroid disease. If you haven't picked up our Code Blue two-pager, it is available outside of the room, and it looks at each of these seven NCDs and how they directly impact women, particularly during and after pregnancy. This series has been made possible through the generous support from EMD Serrano, a business of Merck KGAA Darmstadt, Germany. I would particularly like to thank Yasmin Ruai and Jasmine Greenemeyer from EMD Serrano for all your continued uh, collaboration and support. Um, Woodrow Wilson once said, I not only use all the brains that I have, but all I can borrow. This quote really speaks to me and our work at the Maternal Health Initiative. At the Wilson Center, we work and we study and we write on the issues we cherish most, and then we look outward to see what other people are doing around the world, and we join forces. I'm extremely grateful for the brain power on this stage today, within our partnerships and among the greater Wilson Center staff. Please join me in a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you also to our audience and for all of you watching online. Um, at the end of our event, there will be a Q&A period, so for those of us sitting in the auditorium, please get your questions ready. Um, and those of you watching online, you can submit questions on Twitter to at Wilson underscore MHI. Directly after the event, there will be a reception, so please stay and you can meet the panelists after the event. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator and to welcome back to the center Dr. Anna Langer. Dr. Langer is currently the leader of the Women in Health Initiative at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Prior, Anna was the founder and director of the Maternal Health Task Force at Harvard, which was a longtime partner of the Wilson Center and the Maternal Health Initiative. Anna has a vast career improving maternal health globally, and it is an honor to have her on our stage. Anna's and all the participants' full bios are located right outside of the door. Um, thank you again for coming, and I'll turn things over to you, Anna. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, coming today. And thank you to, to the Wilson Center uh, for this very good event. I'm sure that with this panel, uh, such a distinguished panel today, we will have a very, very wonderful event. And uh, thank you also for your collaboration uh, with us in particular, with the Harvard School of Public Health and uh, the program I've been leading for some years. Uh, and thank you, Sarah, for the uh, great introduction. Uh, I just want to introduce the panel with some very, very high level figures that were just released uh, in a report that WHO published in collaboration uh, with UNFPA, UNICEF, the World Bank, uh, the UN Population Fund, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, yes, basically those organizations from the UN that provided the latest figures about maternal mortality uh, globally. So uh, you will see, I don't need to uh, read what's on the slide, that a maternal mortality measured in numbers and the ratio of maternal mortality, in fact, decreased quite substantially during the first years of this century and th this millennium. So this is the first report uh, that provides numbers that cover 
the first two years of the Sustainable Development Goals because the period is too short to, to show trends. They include the, the authors of the report included the 15 uh, first years uh, of the century. Uh, the average annual rate of reduction, the last bullet there, or the, the one before last, uh, is still quite low if we want to achieve uh, the uh, goals that are included in the Sustainable Development uh, Goal number 3.1 for maternal mortality. Uh, but still, progress is being made. Most of the deaths are still uh, concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and in Southern uh, Asia, as they were during the Millennium Development Goal era. Interestingly enough, uh, this report also offers uh, some not so good uh, statistics about maternal mortality in certain parts of the world. Uh, in particular, in Northern America, uh, the maternal mortality ratio uh, that is already low, in fact, uh, Northern America is classified as a region with very low maternal mortality, but still, during the period, uh, the ratio has increased instead of decreasing. Globally, there are 13 countries where maternal mortality uh, increased, uh, and uh, it's due to a combination of factors, including better data collection and also increased disparities between subpopulation groups, but also true increases in some cases. In fact, in the report, you will be able to find that two countries have been identified as countries with real increases in maternal mortality, and those are the US and the Dominican Republic. Uh, in this context, uh, it's very important to discuss how the causes of maternal mortality and morbidity are distributed. Uh, if having good data about maternal mortality is difficult, having good data about causes of maternal mortality and morbidity and morbidity in general is even more difficult. So there are some key questions for us people working in this field. Uh, so one of them is that we should improve the measurement of causes of maternal morbidity and mortality, and in particular, and very relevant to this panel today, identify the role that indirect causes are playing. We know from other uh, sources of data, not this report in particular, that indirect causes are becoming more prominent compared to uh, direct causes. Uh, but uh, it's difficult to know within that big category which of those uh, causes are due to non-communicable diseases. There are many, that, uh, many deaths that are st and morbidity that are still due uh, to uh, infectious uh, chronic diseases like uh, malaria or like HIV AIDS. But the distinction between NCDs and communicable diseases as indirect causes is quite blurry because now that many people with, uh, living with HIV have access to treatment, they are, uh, well, they're, they're, they are living longer and they are, also, uh, they are also experiencing NCDs and HIV increases the risk for some, uh, uh, some NCDs. So we shouldn't try to establish very clear distinctions between the two. Uh, so another important question is how to look at a maternal health and NCD from a life course uh, perspective, because we know that many of the conditions that become apparent during pregnancy, uh, non-communicable diseases that become apparent during pregnancy, are related to risk factors and, in fact, actual disease before pregnancy and after. So these are some very quick statistics that uh, you are, I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Gestational diabetes increases significantly the risk of type 2 diabetes in the following five years and beyond. Uh, peripartum depression is very um, often associated with depression before uh, pregnancy and also increases the risk of chronic depression and uh, preeclampsia and eclampsia increase the risk of cardiovascular disease uh, for uh, women. And of course, these conditions also affect the, the offspring. Uh, so during uh, our uh, event today, we will hear about these and many other things, uh, hopefully including opportunities that maternal health care offer to edu educate uh, women and families uh, on how to prevent NCDs during pregnancy and beyond. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm sure that uh, our panelists will address many of these issues uh, that I quickly mentioned, and as I said before, many more. Uh, so, uh, as Sarah said, the bios, the full bios, are uh, in, the, uh, in the table outside the room, so I'm not going to uh, make any long introductions.
I will just mention uh, who goes first. In this case, it's Dr. Wanda Nicholson. Uh, Wanda, my pleasure. Wanda is the director of uh, the Diabetes and Obesity uh, Corps at the University of North Carolina Center for Women's Health Research and leads the POWER Partnership for, to Improve Women's uh, endoc Endocrine and Reproductive Health Program uh, at that same uni university, I think. You correct me if I said something wrong. <laughs> sorry, and I, I'm not wearing my glasses. So, sorry about that. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, first, let me um, say a sincere thank you to Sarah Barnes and um, all of those here at the Wilson Center for inviting me um, for this wonderful opportunity to share my thoughts on maternal mortality. And um, it's a pleasure for me to be here to represent ACOG, as well as to serve with my co-panelists here. Um, I'd like to summarize, I know we have just 10 minutes per speaker, I'd like to summarize a few messages on the effects of non-communicable diseases on maternal mortality, and, the, and, and I'll limit my comments to the United States. And I'd like to do it with the following framework. Um, what do we know? What is ACOG currently doing? And then finally, what should we think about? What, sh what should we be doing going forward in time? Well, with all things in life, we know that there is, there's good news and there's not so good news. So that we know in the U.S. there are always, you know, ongoing medical discoveries in the U.S. There's always emerging technologies every day to improve health outcomes. However, unfortunately, the United States has the highest maternal mortality rate of any high-resource country. And if you see this slide, you'll see that I have the U.S. circled with a maternal mortality ratio of 14 per 100,000, compared largely to a range of five to nine per 100,000 live births in other comparable high-resource countries. The U.S., in fact, is the only country outside of Afghanistan and the Sudan where maternal mortality rates have been rising. So we know that um, CBD is the leading cause of death in pregnancy um, and in postpartum in the United States. In fact, 25% of maternal deaths are due to cardiovascular disease or cardiomyopathy. And of course, by cardiovascular disease, we mean ischemic heart disease as well as stroke um, and coronary artery disease. When we think about pregnancy, we know that myocardial infarction postpartum cardiomyopathy, newly developed, cardiac arrhythmias, and as well as congenital heart disease are some of the common conditions that we see in reproductive age women. And then there's a new trend in terms of growing rates of gestational and type 2 diabetes among reproductive age women in the United States. And along with that is a rise in obesity uh, in reproductive age women. And these two risk factors, the rising rates of obesity, as well as the rising rates in, in gestational diabetes and type 2 diabetes further contribute to uh, cardiovascular risk factors in these women. So when we think further, the, the threat of non-communicable diseases to maternal health can be viewed within a really worrisome cycle of CBD risk factors, including diabetes and obesity that can actually complicate the woman's lifespan throughout the reproductive years as well as middle age and beyond. And if we look at this cycle, we'll see that if women are entering pregnancy already at a stage of overweight or obesity, they are at higher risk for excessive weight gain during pregnancy, <laughs> glucose intolerance, and hypertensive disorders that can occur. In the postpartum, they have a risk of postpartum weight retention, persistent glucose intolerance, and higher blood pressures that can often, unfortunately, go unrecognized or undiagnosed. This contributes over time to chronic obesity, CBD risk factors, and that these, and these CBD risk factors can ultimately lead to a future risk of CD, CBD events. Now, what's important when you think about this with regard to the woman's lifespan 
is if they have completed childbearing, they still have all these risk factors that could culminate in a CVD event in middle age or beyond. If they have not completed childbearing, then we actually have a woman who's entering the next cycle of pregnancy who likely has a worse cardiometabolic profile than she did in the previous pregnancy. In many cases, that has gone unrecognized and diagnosed and can lead to further maternal mortality. We know that there are health inequities in access and treatment that often preclude the identification of CVD risk factors, either the CVD risk factor assessment or identification of at-risk women prior to pregnancy. We know there can often be missed opportunities to identify cardiovascular risk factors during the long prenatal course. And we know that in the postpartum period, there can be symptoms of extreme fatigue or shortness of breath that are cardiac symptoms, but are also symptoms that can be routinely seen in postpartum women and that sometimes can be attributed to being postpartum and be overlooked when they really are a sign of cardiomyopathy. We also know that, unfortunately, African-American women have a three times higher risk of death from CVD mortality compared to white women. So in addition to the factors that I've just listed above in terms of barriers, additional factors can include institutional and systematic barriers, as well as racial biases and gender inequities. So leads us to the next question. What is ACOG and others doing? And I'll limit my comments to three primary programs that ACOG is currently actively involved in. The first is the AIMS program, the Alliance for Innovation in Maternal Health. And a ACOG is the lead partner for the AIMS program, which is a national data-driven maternal safety and quality improvement fun program funded by HRSA. And of course, the primary aim of this program is to prevent maternal mortality as well as to reduce maternal morbidity across the United States. We're trying to reach every state, every region, every district to affect women's maternal health. Now, AIMS works at all of these different levels and also works within actual individual hospital facilities. Our goal, as you can see uh, across these three slides, and I won't go across these, through these three boxes, and I won't go into detail. We can discuss it uh, certainly at the question and answer series. It's one, to promote um, public and private partnerships with organizations that can engage and coordinate better health care for women. AIM is also fully dedicated to developing perinatal collaborations that can help hospitals better coordinate their efforts around the care of at-risk at women and help identify additional so resources that they need to take care of this high-risk group. And finally, AIM is focused on creating partnerships with QI or quality improvement teams and developing what we, ret what we refer to as the maternal safety bundles. Now, and I recognize that this slide, there's, there's small print here, but my primary take-home message is here is that there is an array of maternity, sa maternity safety bundles that the AIMS program has developed. And they are primarily focused on conditions by which women are, have high likelihood of having maternal morbidity and mortality. I've listed two of them here. There's one AIMS bundle that focuses on severe hypertension, and there's a second AIMS bundle that focuses on reducing perinatal um, disparities, perinatal racial and ethnic disparities in, in outcomes. What's important is that the safety bundles are a standardized, standardized set of instructions um, that include a collection of resources, um, include steps for acute treatment in hypertensive disease, and also initiatives to reduce racial disparities in healthcare outcomes. And they're all organized under four specific categories that we refer to as the four R's. And these are readiness, uh, recognition, response, and reporting. So that each hospital system has um, a list of activities that should take place to help take care of women. There should be a list of activities to help them to respond to acute situations. And when there are adverse outcomes, a list of learning and responsiveness to help coordinate new efforts. A third key activity of ACOG is an ongoing collaboration with the American Heart Association. This was spearheaded in 2018 to 2019 as part of our pregnancy and cardiac disease. 
And our goal here was to collaborate with the American Heart Association to establish best practices so that we could recognize cardiac disease earlier in the course of pregnancy, early in the course of the intrapartum or labor and delivery phase, as well as in postpartum management. The second key issue here in terms of this collaboration was to help guide clinicians and other maternal health providers to better create collaborative maternity care teams. In many hospital settings and many outpatient settings, um, we have dedicated uh, practitioners who are providing care every day but do not have an organized systematic approach to the high-risk patient who's at risk for cardiovascular disease mortality. So there's a step-by-step -step guide to help clinicians create these collaborative teams, which largely would include OBGYNs, they would include nurse practitioners, include anesthesiologists who are keen to cardiac anesthesia, as well as cardiology. And this is all in an effort, again, to reduce not just maternal mortality, but also maternal morbidity. So we've covered what we know. We've covered what ACOG is currently doing. And now let's move on to what we need to think about going forward. Well, one final piece of information is that we know that a third of maternal deaths occur in the postpartum period. And what's very concerning about this is that the postpartum period is generally viewed as six to 12 weeks. So if you think about the course of prenatal care being roughly nine months, that postpartum period is a very short period of time. And so ACOC has worked over the last year through a second presidential initiative on reframing postpartum care, re-looking at that paradigm. And the goal of this reframing is to emphasize earlier assessment in the postpartum period so that women who are at high risk for persistent blood pressure or cardiovascular disease are seen within the first three weeks postpartum and then are seen on an ongoing basis between three and 12 weeks intermittently as, as, as deemed necessary by their, by their provider. It also promotes continuing surveillance of these women throughout the first postpartum year, either through the GYN physician, through a primary care physician or a cardiologist, or a combination of all three. And finally, ACOG is advocating to um, third party payers to expand their coverage of care through the postpartum period for a minimum up to six months, but if, but if possible up to one year, so that we create a new pathway by which practitioners are able to follow women through the postpartum period. We're able to fill this gap where a third of maternal mortality deaths are occurring and to do it efficiently and effectively. Now, in my last two comments, I'd like to shift to what do we need to think further about going forward? Given that we are moving toward reframing the postpartum paradigm, one of the items that we need to think about more collectively is how do we create this new model of care? And I wanted to briefly mention a pilot study that we're doing at the University of North Carolina that's termed Healthy Transitions. How do we better transition women during this acute phase of care and intense phase of pregnancy care to this first year postpartum? And what our goal is in this program is to not only continue to provide surveillance, but to also continue to integrate um, interventions around dietary changes, physical activity, and postpartum depression. And finally, one of my final thoughts and what we should do going forward is to look toward a broader lens that focuses on the life course approach, looking at how lifestyle factors even prior to conception can make such a high impact in women's perinatal and postpartum course, an effort to look further upstream so that we're focusing on interventions that can reduce obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular risk factors even prior to conception. And this way, we can, work, we can work more fervently to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity. So I know, again, this was a short 10 minutes. And um, it was important for me to share what I thought about what we know, again, what ACOG and others are doing, and what we all need to think about going forward. And I look, further, look forward to further talking about it in the open answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wanda. As I think I said before, uh, we will listen to all speakers and then open the floor. Well, first have a discussion among the panelists and then open the floor uh, to all of you. Uh, so next is uh, Charlotte Warren. Uh, Charlotte is a senior associate at the Population Council. Uh, Charlotte has lived and worked 
worked in 10 African countries over 17 years and was based in the Population Council's Kenya office between 2000 and 2012. And she will tell us about uh, one very special project that, that she currently leads. Thank you, Anna, and hello, everyone. So I have been reading around this issue. Uh, I'm going to be presenting mainly some small, small pieces around the Ending Eclampsia project, which is just coming to an end, which is a, a, a five-year project funded by USAID, looking at um, trying to improve access to underutilized commodities and interventions. But while I was kind of deciding quite what I might be talking about, I came across this quote and that pregnancy as a window of future health. And I think just listening to what Wanda was saying just now, that it really is an opportunity uh, to, uh, what, because women are accessing care to really kind of understand what risks they may be facing later and what may have, um, may be risk factors um, during their pregnancy. So as we heard, we know, we know that hypersensitive disorders in pregnancy, um, women are more likely to have long-term risks. And then if, if women have NCDs, then they're more likely to have preeclampsia and other hypertensive disorders. So it's this synergistic cycle that really is um, challenging for women. And as more women, or increasingly, we're seeing the more women be, be overweight and obese before they start becoming pregnancy, then these issues are really going to uh, continue to be uh, there's going to be more of them and need to be addressed. And even, um, I was surprised to see, having not read into it too deeply, but I surprised to see that even vascular dementia can be, you know, if you have preeclampsia, you're more likely to have the late, later on in life. So there's so many things that can happen. From my side on the public health front and working in international health in low and middle income countries, maybe that's not such a concern at the time when the woman is having hypertension during the postpartum period, but nobody's um, really addressing it or measuring it. And also that children of women who have hypertensive disorders during pregnancy are also at risk of NCDs going forward, which we may hear a little bit more later on that. And just to say that women with preeclampsia have a, a 3.7-fold increase um, risk of future hypertension, a 2.2-fold risk of ischemic heart disease, disease and a 1.8-fold risk of stroke. Um, so the Ending Eclampsia Project um, is coming to an end, and if anybody is uh, interested, we're having a, a, a whole-day meeting tomorrow to discuss some of our findings and um, other work on preeclampsia. Um, so as I said before, we're seeking to expand access to proven underutilized interventions and commodities, um, looking at the prevention, early detection and treatment, and, and, and then looking at expanding or w working with um, gl other global um, institutions. And we, wor we worked in mainly Nigeria and Bangladesh, but also in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Pakistan. And I think Anna already shared some of these figures earlier around the, the recent WHO um, paper that came out um, a few weeks ago. But even though there has been progress, we're seeing an increase in postpartum preeclampsia, an increase with the NCDs, uh, likely more, uh, likely more um, hypertensive disorders. And interestingly, I've got the thing about because of preeclampsia, you only find out about preeclampsia if you measure the blood pressure. And the two leading causes of maternal mortality are postpartum hemorrhage and preeclampsia, both of which you really do need to have a working blood pressure machine. And we know in many facilities globally, they're just not there or they're not used or the provider doesn't take action even when they do measure. So that's kind of the, some of the issues that we need to really think about going forward. I just want to touch on a couple of... Um, projects that we're doing, that the couple of the smaller studies that we're doing, we, we have done. We did some implementation research under the Ending Eclampsia project. One was looking at um, including involving women's groups and making sure that women had um, health literacy, understood why they needed to have their blood pressure done and were demanding having their blood pressure done. Another one was looking at um, focusing mainly, well, mainly, most much of our focus was at the primary health care level so that it was nearer to where women are living that they were getting um, seen and then we also did a uh, followed women from women who had hypertensive disorders in pregnancy 
from birth at birth and we followed them for one year in Nigeria and and Bangladesh and this slide just shows uh, the type of um, hypertensive disorders that uh, women were diagnosed with around the time of birth and we can see that preeclampsia uh, is the highest no eclampsia is actually the highest that's what they were presenting at the hospital but preeclampsia and eclampsia are obviously the biggest um, components of hypertensive disorders. This, uh, this slide just shows um, what happens to women after they've given birth and they have a hypertensive disorder. The blood pressure on day one is pretty good, measured uh, in over between 89 and 99% of women had their blood pressure done on the day after birth. But you can see by day five, um, in, in Bangladesh, only 14% of women had their blood pressure recorded. And this is women who have problems with their blood pressure. So uh, even though it's, it's recommended, it's not happening. Um, so that, that was one key area that we, we noticed um, in this study. And then just this is just showing um, the type of hypertension that women had a year after birth. And you can see it's a bit um, not clear, but the gray is that women were having um, severe hypertension, majority of them at one year down the line after giving birth. And so it's obviously not being stabilized or, or treated appropriately. And this is a challenge in, um, in many of the low and middle income countries. This one, these women were actually recruited at uh, tertiary level hospitals in Nigeria. So even at that point in the outpatients, they're not getting the care um, that they should have. We also asked the women about their experiences over the course of the year. Um, interestingly, in Bangladesh, although we recruited 400 women at the time of birth, very few of them wanted to come back to be assessed. They said, no, no, I'm okay, I don't feel unwell, I don't need to come back to hospital. Uh, and we only actually managed to follow 48 of those 400 women um, for the whole year. However, um, just to show, so the, the, in the brackets is the um, percentage. So just to highlight, uh, there's a couple here that sort of has, um, have you discussed this concern with your, have you, did you have any concerns when you were formed that you had developed hypertensive disorders? And they, they had concerns, the majority, um, but less than only two, 40% in um, Bangladesh actually can discuss this concern with their health provider. And, uh, and then the one at the bottom and the third from the bottom says, now that you have given birth, do you think that your caregivers have given you sufficient information about your future health after having a hypertensive disorder? And in Bangladesh, all the women said, no, I don't know. I haven't got enough information. In Nigeria, it was much better. There was 69%. Um, and then again, um, the last one, have you been counseled on how to prevent this condition in a future pregnancy? One woman in Bangladesh said yes. Uh, and in, uh, there were less than half in Nigeria. So you can see that there's very mixed um, experiences and perceptions of women in these two countries. But basically, they're really not getting the care that they should. So um, kind of like what we've been coming, it was interesting hearing what um, the previous speaker was talking about, the extended postpartum per period. We just had a, a meeting this morning about how we can, what can we do to really make sure that women are followed up closely in the postnatal period. So I really like the idea of the fourth trimester that ACOG has come up with and that we really do need to follow women for a minimum of six months, hopefully one year everywhere. Um, but they're just not being being followed, um, and and it, advising women to come early uh, and more frequently. We can't, um, you know, women don't come early in um, antenatal to, to antenatal. They're unlikely to come in the first trimester in many many countries. If they do, quite often they're sent home again, saying, "Well, you're t you're too early, go home." So they don't even even if they've made the effort to go to a health facility, the providers are not prepared to, to do anything for them. Even just measuring their blood pressure to see what's the norm uh, for that woman before um, the 20 weeks. Again, for you know, if you want to give aspirin, that's a really chat for women who are high risk. 
that's also really challenging because most you're supposed to start that before around 16 weeks. They're not coming till 20 weeks. So there's lots, lots of issues that we really need to try and get women in earlier and the providers to actually do something about it when they come. Um, so, <laughs> my last sentence is <laughs> that basically women should be the center of the care, they should be treated as individuals, and that it doesn't matter who they are, what they are, where they've come from, but we really need to focus on the woman and her lifestyle and how to help her have a healthy life. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Charlotte, for bringing the Global South perspective. Uh, next, uh, our next speaker is Priya Kenison. Uh, she is the policy and advocacy manager for the NCD Alliance. Uh, she leads the Alliance's advocacy efforts on integrating NCDs uh, with uh, HIV AIDS, uh, reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health, and adolescent health, universal health coverage, and financing for NCDs. Thank you, Priya. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you all for being here, and thank you to Sarah and her team for, for inviting me. Um, I'm excited to talk a little bit more about the global perspective of, of NCDs. Um, I'm on a panel with many maternal health experts, so I will leave that to them and touch a little bit on what we at the NCD Alliance and what the global NCD civil society community is really doing to integrate NCDs and maternal health. Um, I'll just say a couple words about what it is that we do. We're a global civil society organization that unites all chronic diseases and their risk factors and was founded in 2009. And we work at the global, regional, and national levels to advance the NCD response and to really build the capacity of NCD civil society to deliver across what we call the four A's of advocacy, access, awareness, and accountability. And within our global advocacy strategy and um, priorities, one of the key areas of focus since we began has really been looking at the gender dimensions um, of NCD risk factors and disease progression and looking specifically at women and girls. So just to start off, this is from um, a series that was uh, began last year, the Lancet Countdown on NCDs. Um, and it's a paper that shows a number of deaths in 2016 from all causes. Women are on the left, men on the right. Um, no surprise, from zero to four, the main cause of causes of death are still communicable. But as we grow older, and even increasingly um, recent data showing in younger people, um, causes of death are now non-communicable diseases. So in 2016, an estimated 40.5 million of this 56.9 million deaths worldwide were from NCDs. That's over 70%. And of these, um, just to break it down into age ranges, and the reason I'm doing that is because WHO defines NCD mortality as premature mortality, which is between the ages of 30 and 70. So you can think that there's a whole load of people under, 70, under 30 and over 70 who are not captured in that description of what we consider premature NCD mortality. So... Um, for those younger than 30 um, in 2016, 1.7 million deaths um, occurred between 30 and 70, 15.2 million, and over 70, 23.6. Um, and the Lancet Countdown paper showed that at the current rate of progress, only 35 countries for women and 30 countries for men are actually on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal target of a 30% reduction. Again, this is premature mortality reduction by 2030. So if you think about those who are falling outside of that 30 to 70 category, many more countries are off track to reach any sort of goal or target. Um, as can be imagined, most of these countries are high-income countries that already have low NCD mortality. So then we shift to NCDs and women. Given a bit of an overall look at um, some of the percentages here. Um, NCDs have been the leading cause of death for women for at least the past 30 years, but are often underreported and undertreated. Um, we've got, I think, around 73% of deaths uh, amongst women. And then we break out things looking at cancer, about cardiovascular disease. We've heard around that. Um, we've heard uh, around 860,000 deaths due to diabetes, looking at respiratory conditions. Um, if anyone's been looking at the current air pollution crisis uh, in places like Delhi, I think we can only imagine that's going to increase. Um, 
looking at de the depression, the rates of depression in, in low and middle income countries, specifically 18 to 25 percent of women are living with depression, and then looking at the cervical cancer rates. So in addition to the NCDs that affect both me, uh, women and men, women are affected by a number of sex-specific NCDs, such as cervical cancer, as well as experiencing the impacts of gender-based violence on their physical and mental health and well-being. We know that those impacts can manifest in physical symptoms as well as mental and emotional as well as looking at the gender norms, roles, power relations, and socioeconomic factors that influence health outcomes and access to services such as gender inequalities, discrimination, cultural norms that affect social independence. So, and women and their children living in poverty in rural areas with low levels of education, again, have poor coverage across the continuum of care. So they're receiving less access to services, to preventive services, to education about risk-seeking behaviors, to the risk factors for NCDs. Um, so I think I might have skipped ahead on myself, but anyway, <laughs> what this graph, um, what the graph previously and sort of both of these graphs that I've shown you so far, so far don't capture is a prevalence of co or multimorbidities, which is the likelihood of a person living with NCDs having one or more chronic conditions concurrently. And with almost every chronic dis uh, disease, there is an impact on a person's mental health and well-being. Uh, to give you an example of that, we have an initiative called Our Views, Our Voices, which um, surveyed around 2,000 people around the world living with NCDs. And a common thread among many of these people that we spoke with was that they would rather be diagnosed with HIV than with an NCD due to the availability, availability of care and treatment um, and to the stigma and discrimination. So that just goes to show how far we've come with HIV, but how far we have yet to go with the NCD agenda. Um, looking at uh, cervical cancer specifically, Asia and Africa account for 76% of new cervical cancer cases and 80% of cervical cancer deaths. Um, again, talking about the, the co uh, morbidity aspect of this, the National Cancer Institute estimates that one in three people with cancer experience mental or emotional distress. Up to 35% of cancer survivors experience symptoms of depression and up to 45% experience anxiety. And that stat is specifically for the U.S. And so when we expand that to countries that have a much higher burden, much lower access, much more um, stigma and discrimination around talking for mental, about mental health um, and depression and anxiety, we can only imagine the stresses there. So looking at um, the sex differences again in the exposure and response to NCD risk factors as well as disease progression, um, women and children in low and middle income countries, I'm going to draw on air pollution because that's quite front and center for us these days, um, are much more exposed to indoor air pollution um, due to the fuel used in cooking. So increasing rates of uh, chronic respiratory disease um, as well as looking at the social and cultural norms um, and the lack of safe space that can prevent women and girls from engaging in physical activity, contributing to the risk of obesity. Um, and though, even though we know that the estimated burden of cervical cancer is more than 10 times greater in low and middle income countries than in high income countries, in some of these countries, screening is just not possible due to cultural sensitivities or limited access to healthcare centers. So there are some innovative screening methods that are culturally sensitive that are being developed by some of our partners to reach those populations that are often left behind. In Papua New Guinea, for example, there's a new easy to use HPV test um, that's being um, implemented in a test and treat approach. Um, <clears throat> so, one last year um, at the United Nations, so we do a lot of global work with the UN and WHO and governments, um, one of the things that came out of what was this high-level meeting on NCDs was expanding the NCD agenda from, from what was previously considered a four by four, the four risk factors of unhealthy diet, tobacco, alcohol use, and physical inactivity, leading to the four main NCDs of cardiovascular disease, rest, chronic respiratory disease, diabetes, and cancer 
to expanding it to a 5 by 5 to include air pollution under the risk factors and mental and neurological conditions under um, the NCD agenda. And this, again, is responding to our evolving world, to what we're seeing in people living with NCDs. And all of this, I should say, obviously affects the maternal mortality and maternal health, um, when, especially when we're talking about a life course approach um, and the intergenerational uh, transfer of risk factors um, and exposure to risk factors. And so what, what we're really looking at is how we can have an integrated agenda and look at addressing all of these risk factors. And it might seem like a very large agenda, I do know that. Um, but when we look at these, they do have common solutions um, as well as shared challenges. And that's really what, what we at the NCD Alliance are really trying to communicate with our partners, with governments and other stakeholders, is that when we are addressing these risk factors, so we're addressing the policies in our environments in which we live, work and play, that we will benefit all of those negative outcomes, all of the diseases that are not lifestyle choices. Nobody chooses to have these diseases. They're a result of the availability of the foods that we um, that are in our in our um, communities of of safe spaces for for physical activity for um, the the right to live in mark in marketing free environments from unhealthy products um, and from clean air. Um, so, so really looking at all these things, we're trying to impact policy that trickles, trickles down, if you will, to, to the community level um, to really impact the health and well-being of all, but really looking at how women and girls can really be a key population for change. At all of and through all of this is the importance of ensuring that people are at the center. And I know um, that was previously said is ensuring that that women are at the core of what we're doing. And so um, and everything that we do, we have an advocacy agenda that we have um, was really developed with people living with NCDs at their core. And so what I will leave you with is sort of a snapshot of where the global NCD movement has come from and, and where we hope it is headed um, together with all of you. Um, it's, it's relatively young uh, in that it began around 2011 with a high level meeting on NCDs where world leaders recognized NCDs as a global development challenge. We then moved into 2013 and 2014 where WHO started establishing 25 by 25 NCD targets, a 25% reduction in, again, premature mortality by 2025. No surprise, we're not on track for that either, um, which is a running theme. Um, and then 2014, also, we had another high-level meeting on NCDs, and that took global down to national, saying what needs to happen at the national level in order to achieve global targets. And then 2018, we had NCDs in the SDGs, and this year we had a high-level meeting on universal health coverage. So there is a whole load of targets on NCDs in the global development agenda, how they relate to maternal care, how they relate to m a multitude of the other SDGs. And what I think, I think there's a common theme in what we're saying is that you know, we really need to bring the communities together and ensure that the community voice and the, the, the person's voice, and I won't use the word patient, because we use um, the frame, uh, the empowering frame of people living with NCDs to ensure that's at the core and really informing what we do. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Priya. Uh, next, we will hear uh, from uh, Dr. Lisa Waddell. Uh, Lisa is the Deputy Medical and Health Officer at March of Dimes and the Senior Vice President, Maternal Child Health and Newborn Intensive Care Innovation. Uh, welcome, uh, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. I, too, want to thank the Wilson Center and the team here for the invitation and the opportunity uh, to join you today and to share a few remarks. Again, I am Lisa Waddell with the March of Dimes, and a few words about the March of Dimes. Many of you may know the organization. We've been around for 80 years. Uh, if you all recall, we were very instrumental in the fight against polio when everyone collected dimes and the kids and everyone sent those dimes up to Washington, uh, D.C., and since that time, the 
March of Dimes has been involved in many innovative kinds of policy and systems changes to impact things, uh, not only like uh, polio, but also um, universal newborn screening, which now ensures that babies are screened uh, at birth for up to 31 treatable conditions, uh, and that women are educated on the importance of folic acid to fight neural tube defects uh, and uh, to prevent um, uh, and we've, you know, worked on the to ensure the fortification uh, of wheat and corn masa flour to ensure that women receive that that folic acid. And so we continue to invest in working in uh, the space of advocacy and policy and effective programs in order to address the urgent crises impacting the health of moms and babies all across this country. And that's really what uh, the March of Dimes is all about. So our mission is to lead the fight for the health of all moms and babies, and we know that we can't do that alone. And what I'm here to share with you today is that to talk about this notion of the mother-baby dyad, that we've got a crisis impacting our mothers and we have a crisis impacting our babies. Uh, and the March of Dimes is deeply concerned about that, and we know that uh, many of you also are very concerned about this, that moms and babies are dying and suffering unnecessarily. One in 10 babies is born too soon. That means before 37 weeks gestation here in this country. That means two babies die every hour in the United States. More than 22,000 infants still die before their first birthday in this country. And we at the March of Dimes have been focused on, with many partners, trying to impact preterm birth because that's a leading contributor to infant mortality. And then we've got this crisis of certainly impacting mothers. About every 12 hours, a woman dies due to complications resulting from pregnancy, and more than 60% of those are preventable. Uh, so that's not okay. And then not only do we have the crisis, but as you all already heard, uh, we've got some things that point to real significant uh, disparities that are not just wrong, but really are unjust. We continue to have these unacceptable disparities, both in preterm birth and in maternal health outcomes. And as we examine maternal deaths, again, we see this troubling trend that African American women are three to four times more likely to die as a result of childbirth than their white counterparts. The pregnancy related deaths per 100,000 live births for black women is 43.5 compared to 12.7 for white women and 14.4 for other women. And similarly, and sadly, we've got the same challenges happening uh, with um, preterm birth. The preterm birth rates also remain unacceptably high in a disproportionate manner for African American women, um, uh, uh, Alaskan Native uh, women, and Hispanic women. And if you think about it, that's happening in this country. We have all these resources, one of the most developed places in the world, and it's costing us at least $26 billion per year. So why? Why are we still uh, having this? Uh, and why is the United States amongst the most dangerous person, most dangerous nation to deliver uh, a baby? So to elevate awareness of this maternal and child health infants in crisis, we released the 2019 March of Dimes report card. And uh, this is what it looks like, the front cover. And you have, um, I left a copy of it out there for anyone that would like uh, to have that. And what I want to point out here is that we've been releasing this report card since 2008 uh, to spur action by stakeholders on interventions and advocacy priorities to raise the public awareness about the seriousness of preterm birth, to contribute to changing the narrative around the disparities that exist, and to draw attention to these real challenges that uh, women and infants are facing in our country. So this slide here gives you some context on the rising rate of preterm birth here in the United States. States. And as you can see, for the fourth year in a row, the preterm birth is uh, rate is continuing to rise here in the United States with a rate of 10.02. That means we've got many more states that uh, have corresponding worst grades this year. Uh, seven grades, seven states have a preterm birth rate uh, that made them have a grade of F. Uh, here uh, in the United States. Uh, here in Washington, D.C. and Maryland earned a C-minus, uh, and Virginia earned a C-plus. 
So this year, we've also made some important changes uh, to the report card so that it focuses beyond uh, preterm birth, but also provides a more comprehensive view of the state of maternal and infant health. So to do this, we did some fine tuning around some of the, the grades, a C, a C minus, that sort of thing. But we also highlighted some social determinants of health to highlight the importance of these inequalities, such as poverty and access that have negative consequences for moms and babies. We talk a lot about the clinical interventions and the things that we're trying to do to improve the health of moms and babies. But we know that there's some of those things underneath that iceberg that we really got to get at. And we try to lift up some of those in the report card this year. We've also added a focus on maternal health because we're talking about a crisis of moms and babies in this country. And they are linked. And so we are talking about that uh, in this report card. And we also wanted to make sure we highlighted some policy solutions um, and some program kinds of actions that we think will make a difference. And you heard about some of those already from one of the speakers uh, here today. Um, so given all that and those, those numbers, it should be no surprise that uh, at the March of Dimes, we have a really bold vision uh, about fighting for our healthy moms and strong babies and trying to work to achieve e equity. And so that means ending preventable maternal deaths and morbidity, those serious complications uh, related to the birth of a child, uh, working for strong babies. That means keeping our eye focused on ending uh, what's happening with preterm birth and certainly achieving equity and trying to ad address those disparities and that gap um, that exists. So in order to achieve this vision, we have to acknowledge and tackle some really uh, important issues. And one such issue uh, one such issue, um, so a little hard to see the colors here, is this piece around access that um, the March of Dimes did a report um, last year, October of 2018, called Nowhere to Go. And it really talks about the challenges that we've got around lack of access to maternity care uh, providers across this country. And that we found that 35% of counties in the U.S. are considered maternity care deserts, meaning five, meaning that these are counties with no hospitals offering obstetrical services and no OB providers. And that there were 5 million women living in these counties. And that 150,000 babies are born to women living in these counties. So when you're talking about the rise of uh, diabetes and the rise of uh, chronic other chronic health conditions, and then women are not able to get that care before pregnancy, can't get that care during pregnancy, it should be no surprise that we've got these challenges. Um, we've also got even more places where there's limited care. So access is a real issue. And then I want to be sure to touch on this piece here, that in addition to uh, access, there are the things underneath that iceberg that we really need to focus on, those underlying determinants such as racism, implicit bias, environmental conditions, and economic stability. Those are the harder issues, the tougher things that we've got to tackle. And we think that there are some policy kinds of solutions that we're trying to promote and to advance to address these things. Uh, we know that um, that group prenatal care has been shown to, uh, to, to help, where women are receiving their care in a group setting, their clinical care and a high dose of educational components, and they help to support each other. So that support before, during, and after pregnancy is important, and it's been shown to have a reduction in preterm birth. So we think that there's some important programs like that, and the March of Dimes has a component of um, group prenatal care, a program called Supportive Pregnancy Care that we're trying to uh, get people to learn more about and, and consider in their practices. But I also just came from the American Public Health Association and the director for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. Red, Redford, um, talked about science and data and that science and data should drive policy, and that policy is really important in terms of making a difference. So I want to quickly just touch on 
some policy issues, and I think you've heard some of these. The importance of access to public health insurance, expanding Medicaid up to 138% of the federal poverty level, the notion of Medicaid extension to that postpartum, through that postpartum period to at least, uh, we like to see it for at least one year postpartum, supporting the establishment of the maternity, maternal mortality review committees everywhere in all uh, states uh, so that we can really learn what's happening and then um, have recommendations to make um, uh, hopefully some solutions. And then um, the support the perinatal quality collaboratives, many of which are adopting the AIM bundles that were referenced. And then it's really important that there, there's a lot more that we need to, to study and to research. And so we're so grateful uh, for our partner, EMD Serrano, that's helping and working to support the March of Dimes Center for Social Sciences Research. March of Dimes is known for our clinical and basic science research centers, but we also have a Center for Social Sciences Research where we're looking at uh, issues around geographic disparities and birth outcomes and their relationship to social factors. And what might that tell? us that might help us in uh, making a difference in these issues. Workforce issues, employment and workplace as determinants of perinatal uh, health care. Uh, the piece around paid leave is something that we're doing some re research in from a social sciences perspective and that you know, is that a reason that women are not able to come into care uh, and to get the kind of care that they need for themselves and for their infants? So as I close, uh, I just want to say this is Prematurity Awareness Month, and we have a lot of work to do, and we cannot do that alone, um, but we certainly believe that if we uh, get the adoption of more evidence-based programs, that we really have a strong focus on policies, both at the state level and at the federal level, and that if we look underneath that iceberg and tackle these tough issues and continue to work collaboratively, that we are convinced that we can move the needle and we have to continue to move the needle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Last but not least, uh, we will hear from our last uh, speaker, uh, Terry Livingston. Uh, Terry is the head of the Patient Outcomes and Solutions Team in North America Medical Affairs at EMD Serrano. Welcome, Terry. Thank you, Anna. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here with all of you today. I want to thank Sarah and the Wilson Center for providing me this opportunity. Again, as Anna said, I'm Terry Livingston, and I'm um, part of EMD Serono. And my topic is really going to be focused on one of the NCDs um, and looking at maternal health um, within MS. And so when I, um, I entered into MS in 2006, and when I think back about um, kind of at that time, there were only four DMTs that were available for uh, multiple sclerosis, and now there are 17. And so if you think about from 2006 to now, that's one DMT that was approved every single year over the 13 and a half years. And so for me, right, to be a part of MS, like that's amazing. And it really allows providers and patients to have option, you know, treatment options, um, but it also gives patients hope um, most importantly. Um, and when I think about kind of what the panel, the other panel members have said and kind of the thread with all of the other NCDs, um, I really think that um, MS is one of those use cases that we can think about. Um, and I say that because um, MS primarily affects women. Um, you know, the, with the average age of diagnosis is about 33 years of age. And that's when, again, women are really thinking about having a family. Um, it, they, it also, um, from new prevalence studies, the um, recent data suggests that there's 4 million patients with MS now worldwide, and actually a million in the U.S. And so um, it, it was thought of as a disease that affect Caucasian women. And just like the changing face of the U.S., MS is also changing. In, in fact, the incidence of MS is highest now in African-American women. 
And so again, it's important that we raise awareness to these things and, 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 and addresses some of what was touched upon by Lisa around addressing race, um, ethnicity, and disparities and, and social determinants of health. Um, the other is that there's this link, and data shows that with MS, there's a link with other autoimmune disorders, more, most commonly hypothyroidism. Um, and also recent um, data suggests with some of these inflammatory diseases that there's a, a link and an increased risk of MS patients also having other comorbidities such as hypertension and diabetes. So you see again this common thread um, as a as a disease. MS um, as a, from a symptom standpoint, 40 to 60 percent of patients have either anxiety like mood disorders that include anxiety and depression. So again, there's this common, and I think it touches upon all of the um, NCDs that were identified in the uh, blue, uh, the uh, code blue series. Um, and so again, I think that um, it's important, right, to really raise awareness around this. And so when you think about MS, and again, from a maternal health standpoint, and in particular around pregnancy, um, it is something that should be discussed when and brought up early to have that conversation. I think it's never too early to have that conversation um, about family planning. In fact, um, what we do see is that um, when you, when there was a recent study that was published last year, that when you, um, when it comes to pregnancy, the incidence and the prevalence of pregnancy in MS has actually risen over the, you know, from 2006 to 2014, in comparison to those without MS, where you see an actual reduction. And so some of it may be, you know, there, um, I think back in 2006, it wasn't talked, to, it wasn't talked about a lot. And so I think now that there's more data, and there um, is a um, perception of, of, of again, being able to become pregnant, I see. I think that's where the trends may. Uh, you, we see that there's an increase in the trends of of being pregnant. Um, so the other thing that I think is important when you're talking about pregnancy and MS is the impact of right pregnancy on the disease, and so considerations need to be thought of prior, like prior to becoming pregnant. Um, but also what happens during pregnancy and then postpartum. So what we see uh, from the data is that, you'll, you know, MS patients will have relapses, but um, pregnancy is, is, an, is immunotolerant. And so what you do see is that it actually, because of the changes in hormones, you see a reduction in relapses um, in patients, again, with MS. And so... Um, what, but what's important is that you need to, and, and, and people with a mess need to be aware of what happens postpartum, because that's when you actually see an increase in relapses. And not only is there an increase, but there's also um, the severity of the relapse are worse. Um, and for um, some women, this is actually how MS presents. Um, and what I'll share with you, and I don't know if you closely looked at the bios, um, this is actually what happened to me. So I was diagnosed with MS back in 2006, and so I've been living with the disease for over 13 and a half years. Um, and for me, when it, it, it presented itself shortly after the birth of my second son. Um, and I had these symptoms, right? I had this profound fatigue with, that I didn't have with my first child where I couldn't even move off the couch and it took every effort for me to be able to breastfeed my child, um, my second son. But I guess he did okay because he is now 15 and he's 6'1". <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did notice that there were, you know, I had cognitive issues where it impacted my short-term memory um, my word finding um, became more difficult. Um, but again, blamed it on pregnancy. Women who have children, you know, pregnancy and child ring, that you lose brain cells. Um, um, it, you know, it also, um, I had burning feet. And again, what prompted me to go to a, the physician was I had hearing loss, ringing in my ear, and bouts of vertigo. 
and I was diagnosed with Meniere's disease, but despite that and being treated for it, my symptoms progressively got worse to where I had this whole right-sided weakness um, and I had difficulty in, in my, uh, I had difficulty in walking and it became very visible. Went to the ER, multiple hospitalizations, multiple diagnostic tests. I'm not the typical MS patient. Right? I just shared with you most, most commonly it's Caucasian women. And so it was about two, almost two years before I actually got the diagnosis of MS. Um, and so, um, again, I, I just share that with you because, again, the, the importance, I, you know, I didn't, if looking back, hindsight, um, I had MS, you know, before the birth of my second son. Um, but I, again, didn't know because these things are so subjective that it could have been MS. Um, so what, you know, when it's important, though, when you're thinking holistically, again, about um, a person having MS, and again, when they're thinking about family planning, right, that you want to have that conversation as early as possible. You want to be able to talk about when is the timing right? When does it make sense? It's, imp um, it's important that the disease, act the activity, and that the, the disease is stable prior to having um, a child and planning to become pregnant. And then, of course, choice of treatment is important because it certainly has implications. And then, it's similar to any other um, kind of chronic disease, it would be follow the advice, right, of, of, of um, those other diseases as far as it relates to uh, pregnancy. And so what, um, you know, when I think back and, and when I was diagnosed in 2006, there wasn't a lot of, you know, people didn't talk about it. It wasn't something that was on top of, you know, that commonly was spoken about amongst MS patients. In fact, what I often heard was um, physicians would discourage women from having um, fam a family. And actually, I've even heard some say they couldn't have a family. And so again, the data suggests otherwise. Um, I think right, there is a big opportunity to provide education. Um, today, it's very different and that there is a need that there is a need to have more information around family planning. And so we've actually um, are developing a family planning resource center within a within my MS teams, which is a social network for MS. There's about over 138,000 MS um, patients that are members of this. And so we feel that this is a good way right, to provide credible information around this important topic. Um, the other initiatives, again, that I wanted to kind of just highlight from a more global standpoint, and this is led by our government affairs and advocacy team who are in the audience, thank you. Um, one being, um, at least already touched upon it, healthy women, healthy um, economies, and it's really to focus right on a larger scale, more global, around policies of the identification and implementation of policies to advance women's health and being um, and, and their well-being to support um, the, their economic participation. And then the second initiative is around in, um, is called embracing cares. And this is a real focus on the caregiver and to be able to support and help mitigate the uncertainty felt by many MS caregivers. Um, and I'll just I just end with. Um, I'll just end with right that I that I really believe that there needs to be more research conducted, especially you see the common thread. And again, um, if we can better understand that, it hopefully leads to be better health outcomes. Um, we need to continue to answer uh, to address those unanswered tough questions. Um, and at EMD, I'm fortunate right to be in a, a position where that is my role in in driving research efforts and so i'm able to tackle kind of these these topics around more of the disease state um so, and such as comorbidities you know symptom management race ethnicity and healthcare disparities um and so um i just again i i i i see my icms as a gift it's actually open it's given me kind of this inner strength to persevere and not allow this disease to define me. 
with the courage to share my story and the compassion to listen to others um, living with MS, it has allowed me to impact people in a way that I could have never imagined. Um, I'll just share with you a story. I had a former colleague who was diagnosed with MS. Um, of course, she was um, afraid, alone, um, and she needed somebody to talk to. And so um, I sat with her, and afterwards, um, she sent me this beautiful email that um, the, the words will stay with me forever, and I wanted to just share it with you. Um, she wrote, thank you for holding my hand through this door we call a mess. I will forever be grateful for the strength and the wisdom you've given me. I know I'm not alone because I have you. You will always be a part of my MS story. So those, right, it, it's, it, it's just being there and being able to listen and to uh, allow that person to know that they're not alone that has such a profound impact. And so... These words, as well as other examples, have driven me, you know, driven my passion professionally to continue the research efforts to really um, make a difference in um, others living with this disease, their families, and caregivers. So thank you. Thank you, Terry, for a great presentation and for sharing with us uh, your story. Uh, we are a little behind a uh, schedule uh, because we started a little late and uh, we took a little longer uh, than originally planned. So uh, I will only ask one question to the panel, trying to uh, give you a chance to uh, provide your answers, thinking in particular about approaches and solutions. Uh, to the uh, issues that uh, you discussed uh, with us today. And then we'll open the floor to the audience because I wouldn't want to take too much time without engaging in a dialogue uh, with all of you. So uh, I think that in all your presentations, uh, it was obvious that NCDs represent a big burden during the maternal health period and beyond for both women and children. And uh, also, uh, I heard in different ways that the visibility, the awareness, the resources uh, that are available uh, to address this uh, big uh, condition, a uh, set of conditions, uh, are uh, limited. Uh, so you represent different sectors, and you come from different perspectives. So I would like you to choose one priority, or maybe ma a maximum of two, uh, for uh, the U.S. government, uh, the U.N. in terms of policies and, and programs, the private sector, and the donor agencies. If you could think of what you think would be most important to address the burden of NCDs uh, and women's health, in particular maternal health, and also to break the silo, uh, silos in which uh, that characterize the way we are currently addressing maternal health and NCDs. It's a very broad question, uh, but uh, we don't have too much time to get into more detailed ones. So uh, I hope you don't mind. Who would like to start? One or maximum of two priorities. Hi. Yes, Lisa. Oh, it's already on? OK. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. So um, thank you for that, that question. Um, I know you said one, but two key <laughs> things really come to mind for me. I knew it would be <laughs> <laughs> One is clearly this notion around access, and I think access to insurance is important, and we still have many places in this country where um, women, um, low-income families do not have access to insurance, and there's an opportunity for Medicaid expansion. So the notion of a policy change that can impact many, many uh, people, and I also think will have an impact on disparities. If you look at the states where we don't have Medicaid expansion and you see some of the places that do have Medicaid expansion and the, the benefits that um, uh, uh, they're seeing, uh, particularly in women of color, then Medicaid expansion, I think, is important. The Medicaid extension so that women can receive that care up to a uh, full year postpartum um, 
uh, is important. And then the other piece is paid leave. I think that's really something that's starting to take off in different states and that there are those that we believe do not come in for care because, you know, they have to make these tough choices about being able to continue work, not lose their job, not um, lose that pay. And so paid leave, I think, is an important policy um, change that we as, an, as a country uh, should consider. Thank you. Great two priorities. Uh, yes, Wanda. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on, on two of those comments. I think one is, um, as I alluded to in the talk, about the fact that a third of maternal deaths occur in the postpartum period. So I would, again, support the expansion of Medicaid and expansion of insurance coverage in general to cover, if not six months, up to a full year postpartum. I think this is important for not just reducing maternal mortality, but we don't want to forget about maternal morbidity. Mm -hmm. And we also don't want to lose this opportunity. I mean, it's often quoted that pregnancy is a window on the future of women's health. It's a window on the future of the next cycle of their reproductive health as well. So by not providing that coverage and not taking advantage of that time, we're, it's a missed opportunity to intervene, knowing what we know based on what the previous pregnancy um, has shown us. So that would be one major step. I think the um, second piece does have to do with um, providing a broader view of collaboration between all the different types of providers who take care and provide maternal health. You know, it's not just an obstetrician gynecologist world. It also includes nurse midwives, it includes nurse practitioners, particularly when we talk about geographical regions, particularly rural regions. I'm from North Carolina and there can be wide variations in who's providing the maternal, paternal care. So we do need to have some risk stratification that occurs early in pregnancy or either prior to pregnancy, where we can try to identify those women who are truly lower risk versus those who are moderate or high risk. And for those women who are in rural areas who have limited access, being able to have an upfront idea of where they might need to be able to get their care over the course of pregnancy, rather than the, the transfer occurring after an acute event um, has, has, has risen. So I think that's another way of reducing morbidity as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Bria. I would say, um, building off of these, I think, um, looking at how we can ensure comprehensive integrated healthcare systems instead of systems which I think treat people as body parts or symptoms, and really looking at how people live their lives. We are not exposed to one specific risk factor at one specific point in time. We're exposed to many, and so I think that will have great impacts on maternal health, on child and adolescent health, looking at a life course approach and looking really at a more prevention-based model versus treatment-based. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Terry and then Charlotte. Um, so, um, you know, I, I know as Priya said and as I said um, in, my, in our presentations, right, that there is this common thread. I think, of, again, of, of all the panelists, if, if there's an opportunity, I think we, we, we spoke in our silos, but if we can come together to kind of learn from one another and understand mm -hmm. um, how we can approach this collectively together, um, I, I think it's, um, I can't remember who said it, but I think it is about continuing our research efforts, again, together, um, because was it you, Anna, that said data and science drive policy? Lisa. <laughs> right? So I, I do think, again, if we can approach it that way, that, again, that will, will have a, a big impact and lead to potential policy changes. Wonderful. Thank you. Sharon? Uh, just to go to the kind of global um, mm -hmm. piece and um, maybe the UN agencies and the big um, global donors, I think there is a number of policies out there like ending preventable maternal mortality and uh, a range of other international kind of statements. Um, but there's this big policy do gap and we know what we need to do. We know we can save lives. Most of these deaths are preventable. And yet there's still that, um, there's that gap and, and we're all trying to kind of narrow that gap. Um, but it's about, you know, raising awareness, the advocacy piece that some, some of you have talked about at, at country level. Why, why is money, why are the budgets so small for health and for maternal health and for um, newborn health? Um, so I think, I think we're going in the right direction. We've seen the reduction mm -hmm. in, uh, it's gone down to less than, is it 290? Mm -hmm thousand women are dying every year still a huge number mm -hmm. but we are seeing progress so we should build on our progress we should work together the collegiality is extremely important but build on the progress you know recognize the um the good things that have happened 
and build on those because things are more likely to happen. But I, I do think these days, I think 20 years ago, there was a lot, lot more discontent between... Um, Disconnect. There was a disconnect between the people who thought, oh, everybody should go to a facility or everybody should do this or everybody should do that. But now there's a lot more groundswell of working together and uh, to make sure that women have access to healthcare when they need it. Thank you. Well, since you were so efficient at identifying one or two priorities, I have one more question and then I will open the floor to all of you. Obviously, there are some, uh, well, important biological factors that increase the risk of uh, women uh, for NCDs during pregnancy uh, and uh, beyond. But I would like to you to elaborate a little further uh, on social determinants. And in particular, I heard you talking, uh, different people mentioned, uh, well, gender uh, as an issue in terms of utilization of care and the care that providers may offer. Uh, some of you talked about racial bias, uh, and I think someone mentioned stigma of disease. Uh, I don't know if any one of you would like to elaborate a little more on those social determinants or any others. Of course, poverty and education were also mentioned. Sure. Um, I think this is a really important issue, and I think, again, it's getting underneath the iceberg on, uh, to talk about some of the issues that are harder and tougher. We've got a long history in this country of structural racism, of racism, and if you think about it, the best way I've sort of heard this described by um, Dr. Michael Liu is that you've got years and years that are generational stressors. And it's like the, the, the foot's on the gas pedal all the time and the stress on top of stress on top of stress, particularly for women of color. And then that, there are biological factors behind all of that that talk, you know, they imp impact your immune system and, and all those sorts of things. So this notion of how do we fundamentally change the culture um, of institutions, the policies of institutions, the way in which women are listened to so that they really are heard, um, what kind of training is needed, like implicit bias training from maternity care providers. Um, the training is step one. You, know, you have to act on that training. So I think that's one thing that's it's harder, but I think it's something that we need to address. The other things are you know, the things that we've been talking about before, you know, transportation, what are those kinds of barriers? Homelessness is a big, you know, challenge for many um, uh, women. And so those kinds of um, social determinants of health type issues are things that we need to learn more about and, and try, uh, try to uh, address. And I think that's why um, uh, another is, uh, as uh, Dr. Nicholson talked about, the notion of uh, different types of providers. Um, another provider is our, our doulas, to be there to be really supportive. And they've been shown to be really um, an adjunct and an important adjunct to the healthcare sort of team, if you will, um, to be to ensure that that woman is getting that support and being heard and, and having someone to help advocate for her before and during and after her pregnancy. Thank you. Yes, Terry. And I would add um, that that one is just again raising awareness. Um, I think when you think about when you look at MS, less than one percent of any studies or publications even speak about MS in the minority population. Um, the other issue, at least within MS, and and I think within the pharmaceutical from a pharmaceutical perspe company perspective. Um, we still have challenges of enrolling minorities into our clinical trials. And so we have to be better about, um, about developing materials that are culturally competent, that we can develop programs to be able to understand um, what those, right, what the barriers are, and, and be able to go, you know, be able to um, develop programs where we can go into the communities, develop that trust, and then have them be part of our clinical trials. Because again, without that participation, right, we, we, we need to have them involved in our clinical trials to better understand how our drugs work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just a, a few comments, just to follow up. I think whenever we're talking about biological factors when it relates to racial ethnic disparities, we always have to start really with the social dis determinants. You know, where women live and work, uh, what the exposure is to, to chronic stress and racism, because that then 
uh, has broad implications for the underlying biological and physiological changes and mechanisms that can occur. Um, and I think that those stressors and racism do contribute to chronic anxiety, chronic depression that contribute to what we see from a biological and physiological standpoint and, and ultimately the develop, development of, these, of disease processes. So I think we need to always keep that at, at the forefront. I think the, the second piece or the second point I wanted to make has to do with uh, again, reiterating the importance of physician training or clinical training with regard to bias, um, but also recognizing that um, we, you know we really do have to groom the current and next generation to be cl to be culturally competent, mm -hmm. and and that's for all of us. And that gets to not just understanding culture; that's in how we speak to a patient. That's with regard to how we listen. You know, we talk about how do we hear the patient's voice. We have to be very cognizant that we want to hear every patient's voice, every woman's voice, every time. And um, and then I think the third point I want to make about the whole issue of racial bias and implicit bias is that um, it's important to have training. And I know across the country there's different training programs that are being instituted. Uh, but this really is much broader than a one or two day training. We have to walk out of that and practice that all of us included every day. And I think most importantly, the commitment to that training and that commitment to a reduction in racial bias must occur from the top. It must occur from the leadership of our institutions. And only if that's the case will we really be able to break the cycle of institutional barriers and structural barriers that we're seeing. Yes, Sharon. Um, I'd just like to build on, on what um, you've Thank just you. said in that um, some of the work that we've done globally is around um, measuring the prevalence of disrespect mm -hmm. and abuse during childbirth. And we did one of the first studies in, in Kenya and we, we found 20% of women felt humiliated at some point during their experience in the hospital. And I think that, that that's one area that we, the, the say it's a movement but there's much more awareness but there's still not enough um, done to address the issues around the providers norms and values that they're not um, treating um, women um, well in you know globally and I think that I mean one thing that I, I all the research that's been done I keep getting asked to review more papers about how bad it is in this hospital here or that hospital there and not enough on this is what we've achieved or this is what we've been able to do to make women feel more safer and, and treated nicely and that the providers are also feeling safe in their environment and have the, the things to do that they should be, you know, be able to do that enabling environment. And I, I get really frustrated that I keep being asked to review these papers about it's bad. Well, it is bad, but we really need to start thinking about what can we do to make it, make it to improve the issue. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Now the floor is open. Uh, to your questions. If you wouldn't mind, sorry? Oh, okay, there are microphones over there that will be circulated. If you could please mention your name and the organization you come from. Yes, there is one over there. Hi, um, Sangeeta Madhav, I'm a professor at the University of Maryland. So um, as a sociologist, the question you've asked is actually quite front and center for me. And I just wanted to throw in one other issue that I think I haven't heard much of, which is political economy. And specifically, I'm thinking about um, the precarity of women um, in the global south, in low-income communities, and urban contexts. And when I'm talking about precarity, I'm talking about women who are, um, don't have stability in their relationships with men, either the fathers of their children or their partners. They are precarious in their families and that they no longer have kinship support to support them. Um, they're precarious in their communities because many of them are migrants looking at very, very unstable livelihoods. And finally, sort of just precarious in the labor market because they don't have access to good jobs. So I would just encourage also, uh, we're talking about social sciences and I appreciate Dr. Waddell's um, sort of point about this. I think it's really important to contextualize all these risks in these various um, other levels that I think uh, bring on some of the distal distal factors that are, mm -hmm. that are critical to understanding this. Thank you for that comment and for uh, adding to the discussion. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yes, please go ahead and uh, please tell us to whom you're addressing your question in case you have a specific question for one of the panelists. Um, this is Aviva, I'm from the World Bank. Thank you very much for the very um, inspiring, um, all the 
um, 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 conversations. Um, th I have two very quick questions. It can be anyone. One is, um, um, is there some good handbooks of NCDs out there or publications from a health perspective and a policy perspective? And the second question is, is there any good programs that integrates um, maternal health and family planning? Thank you. Oh, okay. Anyone? Yes. Uh, the answer to your first question is yes, there are a lot, and happy to share those with you. Um, coming out from the likes of WHO um, and quite a few of the UN agencies as well, um, UNICEF is now working on their guidance, for example, of integrating NCDs into national child health um, structures, given the prevalence and, and really the opportunity of childhood and adolescence being an opportunity for prevention. Um, and on the second, yes, there there are some examples. I'll give you one around um, sort of NCD maternal health and, and looking around f uh, family planning. We work with um, the Healthy Caribbean Coalition um, as one of our, our key uh, national level, regional level partners. And um, they have implemented a cervical cancer screening um, program in around six countries in the region. And as part of that, they're also training educators to talk around family planning and also to integrate other NCD um, risk factor education program. So really trying to present an integrated model of care to address um, understanding that oftentimes if you see someone once, you may never see them again. So really trying to, mm -hmm. to maximize that opportunity. Thank you. Yes, Wanda. And I was going to make the comment again when we, when we talk about expanding postpartum care, one of the key components of that is you know, how do we move toward integrated care? Mm -hmm. So there's always a lot of discussion around family planning, but doing it within the context of what the non-communicable disease might be, you know, whether it's obesity or CBD, as, and combining that with what the woman's long-term, short-term and long-term childbearing goals are. And I think that it can't always be done in one conversation, which is another reason and rationale for prolonging the coverage and the expansion of the postpartum period. Um, having said that, I think in addition to integrating family planning with maternal health, there needs to be the, also the integration around behavioral lifestyle modifications, dietary changes, physical activity, postpartum depression, all of the integrated fashion so that we're, we're broadly addressing maternal health improvement. And just to add to that, um, again, I think it's one of the beauties of group prenatal care because it's amazing uh, the kinds of topics that the women will bring up. Um, and uh, if we remember this, that, you know, still about 50% of pregnancies are unplanned, so you're getting your clinical care, but you're also getting a lot of education around healthy nutrition, what to expect during the pregnancy, et cetera, um, and what do you want to do? What are your plans, you know, after this baby? And so that opportunity to be prepared for that interconception period can start um, through the support of group prenatal care. One of the challenges with group prenatal care is to ensure that uh, there's adequate reimbursement to support the providers that want to do this in their practices. So another important policy issue is how to support um, enhanced payments for group prenatal care. Thank you. Uh, yes, Lois. And then. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Lois McCloskey. I'm from the BU School of Public Health. I'm the faculty there. And my question is going to be get at this idea of uh, systems change because of how absolutely embedded uh, our maternity care system is with the, in the OB profession particularly, separate from our care of women, if there is any, <laughs> in the primary care setting. Um, but first, I just want to say I've had the privilege, I've just finished leading a national initiative called Bridging the Chasm Between Pregnancy and Women's Care Over the Life Course. So it is so wonderful to hear all of you talking just about that chasm, the many chasms, and to hear some of the policy priorities that our working groups have come up with that have bubbled up from those with lived experience, policymakers, providers, and health system leaders as well. So to get to, we've, we thought of this idea of a women's health home, and that's kind of what I want to throw back and ask you, in the US, there are Medicaid-funded health homes, as some here might know, that focus on those with chronic illness, and there are children's health homes with children with special health care needs. What would it be like and what would it take, maybe you first, Dr. Nicholson, to actually have a home 
that wraps around OB and primary care, not only that, but incorporates um, the integrated systems that you've talked about, um, Priya, <laughs> um, with doulas, community health workers, really having that high-touch, community-rooted kind of care. The comprehensive take, what would that, how can we get there? That's a huge question, I know. Um, but I'll throw it back. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. Um, well, there are some, some pregnancy medical care homes that are in existence. Um, okay, but let's take that forward because it's not about pregnancy. I'm really talking about the chasm mm -hmm. that happens after postpartum ends, even, the, even after the fourth trimester ends. No, I, I agree with you. It does have to do, again, with sort of what I alluded to in the talk around healthy transitions. How do we bridge that gap? I think we're, we're saying the same thing. And so, you know, part of that really, um, you know, one idea that's been proposed is do we have better collaborations between maternal health uh, providers, primary care, and pediatrics? Um, in part because women will, in many cases, forego that postpartum visit but will make the child care visits. And so I think it has to do with currently the way the healthcare system is structured, you know, there are these silos. <laughs> and the silos are primarily sort of created around payment, but also around training, what you're trained to do. Uh, a pediatric provider may be wonderful at, of course, at providing early child care, but not feeling as comfortable around uh, maternity care. Uh, well into the postpartum period. So I think we do have to back up and look at it from the 100,000 foot level. How do we look at taking, for example, all the research that you all have done at BU about what women want, um, how they want their postpartum um, care structured, and then use that as perhaps a new or tweaked framework within the current healthcare environment. And that would also have to come along, along with it with a new payment model around that as well. I don't think you can separate the two just based on how healthcare is structured. Um, but I think it does require a collaborative effort first between the different types of providers, and then how do you look at how you could reframe it from a structural standpoint to achieve that goal. I, I can also provide an example. Um, so at a former company, we there not only there's also the rise in not just like medical homes from from a family uh, from a primary care standpoint, but a rise of specialty um, right specialty homes, and so we actually did a study to assess whether um, a MS specialty right uh, uh, MS specialty um, home would lead to better outcomes for patients. And it, it's really looking at that like holistic, kind of integrated, comprehensive care approach and meeting the needs of the patient based on where they are in their journey and incorporating it in their care plans and developing that care plan in order to, again, drive to better outcomes. And so um, uh, it, this is the first MS center that's been recognized by NCQA as a, as a MS patient-centered specialty home. And um, again, I think that there's implications from a reimbursement standpoint, but really the goal is to address the, the needs and issues of, of, a, of a, a person living with MS um, and ensuring that they get the necessary resources, whether it be social work, physical therapy, occupational therapy, all of that's included in that model of care, right? And if they can demonstrate that they're providing quality care, um, that center is is reimbursed at better rates. So we have we have taken efforts and to try to again kind of break down those silos and work together to try to um, think differently and innovatively about how we can conduct the research that's needed. And and just one other, I have one other follow up from that. I mean, I think the other piece is um, going beyond just having those different types of providers on board in a collaborative fashion. You know, is there a way to reframe the model where women are able to come into one facility mm -hmm. and one office, one hallway, mm -hmm. and interact with all of those providers? Mm -hmm. I mean, women, we're, we're complex beings. <laughs> Um, biologically, hormonally, and then we have multiple transitions, whether it's puberty, it's, it's childbearing, it's menopause, it's beyond. So there's definitely different life transitions that occur. And at different points in the life transition, it emphasizes the skill of one provider perhaps more than the other, and then other times they're equalized. And so if we were able to reframe it where there was one place to receive all of that, we really would have integrated transdisciplinary approach to maternal and women's population health if we could achieve that. Thank you, thank you for those great 
replies, I think you raise your hand and then we will take two questions now. And then I don't know, Sarah, if you have any questions uh, from the online participants. Okay. Yes, please go ahead. I'm Virginia Hall and I'm from Pennsylvania the, uh, and work w closely with the medical society there. One of the things I am not hearing and it may have been alluded to, but I think is very important, is 25% of the time domestic violence, the battering starts in the pregnancy. And we need to be aware of that. Uh, I had one lady who had a very normal first baby. During the second one, she had a very severely growth-restricted baby, and nobody asked the question. She had adequate weight gain, adequate blood pressure, no sugar intolerance, and yet nobody put it together that this woman might be abused. And it was a l higher economic thing. So I think we need to emphasize. And in India, for example, where I work every year, um, they have, they did a uh, project where they brought the men in with their women. So you have to be culturally competent as well when you're doing things because they found that the women had a much better outcome and uh, the babies were born more at term. So those are the kind of um, thinking that we need to get out there. Thank you very much for uh, that comment. One more question back there, and then I will let you react to these comments or questions. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Osborne. I'm with the Population Reference Bureau. Um, and I do uh, mobile health implementation uh, research um, on technology for uh, women in need of access in maternal and child health and also sex education. Uh, so I work with a lot of young women. Um, what would you say would be the um, first order of business to attract younger women who may not have their first child yet or are still at risk for these NCDs? How do we get these women into the conversation? And also, how do we get young people and young men? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, anyone? gender-based violence or how to attract younger Yeah, I was going to comment on the, the comment around domestic violence. I, th I think you raised a really important point, and it immediately made me think about the importance, again, of the maternal mortality review committees that are um, existing across the country. Not every state has, has one, but the importance of those and that they're reviewing these cases and, and getting at, you know, beyond just sort of the clinical factors, but what else? was going on that may have contributed to um, uh, the, um, the woman's uh, situation. And so um, that's some of what's being, you know, uncovered too. And so it just, again, to me, is a reminder of the importance of, of those review committees also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yes, Priya. Um, I'll take the second one as someone who is very single, no plans to have children any time in the next five years. <laughs> um, I, I think there are a couple things that my, my colleagues and I who are on the same age talk about a lot because NCDs are not something that you see tomorrow. You you know, it's it's the long game. Um, I think for us, the, the part that resonates is looking at NCDs as a social justice issue. Because when you're looking at the risk factors, um, it's very much around equity and equality, the haves and the haves nots, the access, um, the types and environments in which we live, the zoning of housing and education and affordability of fresh fruits and vegetables, um, to afford a gym, to be able to play outside in an environment that's safe, that has clear walkways and lighting. All of that comes down to the environments that we live in, and I think that's very much a justice issue. And that's something that resonates with um, with everyone, but I think more and more so with people um, in younger demographics. Um, and the other piece that resonated with me was um, last year I was at uh, the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstet Obstetricians Conference, um, and the, one of the keynote speakers said that a, a and please, doctors in the room, correct me if I miss <laughs> misspeak this, um, but said that a girl develops all the eggs that she will carry in her life around the third trimester, uh, the third month or so in her mother's body. So if you think around the types of stressors that a woman um, is experiencing in the interge intergenerational trauma and stress, 
what we're doing. Um, so I, for example, am exhibiting um, or experiencing things that my grandmother experienced when she was pregnant with my mother. And so you think around this intergenerational effects and, and how we have to think about what we're doing, not only for ourselves, um, but society at large. And that can be quite daunting. But um, I think when we talk about the societies that we want to see, um, which is a huge thing around the climate change conversations now, um, I think that's something that really resonates with people. Thank you. If there aren't any further comments to that, uh, that couple of, of comments from the floor, I have one more question for all of you. Uh, what are some additional stressors uh, women with NCDs face when planning for a family, uh, such as contraceptive choice, medications, fertility issues, including preserving fertility, genetics, etc.? Big question. We have six minutes left <laughs> before the reception. Um, I'll just make a, a few comments. I think uh, that's a pretty broad, a broad <laughs> topic. Um, but, you know, I would say from um, th the issue of chronic disease and chronic disease prevention, um, we know that there can be different stressors. It can be where you live, what you do for a living, what your access is to foods, access to healthy foods that can contribute to issues around weight control, glucose intolerance, and ultimately CBD risk factors. Um, so, you know, part of the approach, um, I would think, between the provider and the woman is to, to look at her clinically in terms of an assessment of those risk factors, but also to look at her from a broader um, perspective with regard to social determinants that we've already alluded to today and to attempt to, um, you know, develop a comprehensive plan for that patient around family planning, whether that's contraception or interpregnancy spacing, that's another aspect of family planning um, as she goes forward. Um, um, the, the whole motto of every woman, every time, that's been a motto used by ACOG uh, on many different initiatives, I think applies here that um, we've talked a lot about women's limited access to care or perhaps just being inundated with other aspects of their lives and not presenting for care. So I think when we talk about um, women as a whole, both clinically as well as holistically, and with regard to their family planning or um, how they're going to plan their childbearing, that we have to address these issues every time. Um, they can change over time. It also helps to promote the rapport. Thank you. Uh, Sharon? Yeah, I don't really have any answers to that, but I think we do need to consider the environmental stresses that are out there. And we're currently doing a piece of research in um, Bangladesh um, looking at the salinity levels in the water and the hypertension in pregnancy and whether that there's a correlation between... That. We have seen that there is some in a, a smaller earlier study, but just trying to understand the environmental issues that where the women are living in these um, very harsh environments and then having pregnancies and, and the care and support they get around there. So that's, and then, and then in other countries where, or other areas where there's limited access to water uh, and sanitation and maybe, um, yeah, so, so the environmental issues that we really need to con consider when we, we come across these women. Thank you. Yeah. I think the one thing I would add that I don't know that we've mentioned much today is this notion around mental health and that um, and what women may be experiencing can just be so complex during that whole sort of period before, during, and after pregnancy, and that there's some women that experience loss and they react differently to that, and then there are others that have, you know, a really healthy baby and they react differently to that. You know, everyone may think that's a great and happy period, but for, for many, there it's complicated. And so I think we just have to recognize that um, the decisions that, that women may be faced with regarding family planning can be really complex depending on their own sort of personal mental um, state of which, um, because of stigma and other things, they're not always comfortable in really talking about that. So um, uh, the importance of really um, taking into consideration that kind of support from a mental health perspective uh, that women need, particularly in that postpartum period, I think is really important. Great. Very Priya, last words of wisdom about <laughs> this issue or something else you would like to say? 
I think um, there's just one aspect I think we didn't mention um, as well. I'm sure there are many, but the one that came to mind was the fact that women and girls are more often, uh, most often caregivers in the family unit. Um, And so when you're thinking around NCDs, maternal health, and those stressors, whether they be physical, mental, emotional, um, the the role of caregiver can often affect um, a woman's health-seeking behavior, whether that's prenatal or antenatal care. So that's another, another factor to throw into the discussion. Thank you. Okay, so with that, I think that we are ready to wrap up and you are all invited to the reception. I don't know, Sarah, if you have any uh, any instructions or anything in particular to say? Nope, the reception is right out the door to the right, but let's give the panelists and our moderator another round of applause. Thank you. And one, Yes, keep going, good. One last thing, actually, we will have all of those presentations available online at the Maternal Health Initiative event page. So everywhere you went to RSVP for this event, all of those PDFs will be available um, in PDF form, I mean the the, uh, slide points, okay? So you can have access to all that information later on. And we will also have a live webcast and there'll be an event summary coming out very quickly as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.